Hello again, folks. This is Jeffrey Donaldson here with another Jeweler's Eye reading of a new poem from a recent volume of Canadian poetry. Coming to the plate this time around, all Babe Ruth-like, pointing at the bleachers, is Jan Zwicky's poem, Small Song, published in her 2011 volume entitled Forge with Gaspero Press. Now, I tend to look at smaller poems, but this reading, I think, will be unique among most of the others in that it is a genuinely small poem. There are a number of poems in the volume with a small song in the title, small song on surrender, small song falling asleep, but this one is called just small song. This isn't a haiku, but my approach comes with this inquiry in mind of what sort of good things come in small packages. So... Small Song When you kiss me, snow is falling. It fills the pine trees in the night. My grief slips from me like a shawl then, like lace. Your hands lift the pins from my hair. So, all right, this is a small song in the sense that it is a small poem or a short poem, though if that were all that were at stake in the word small, we might imagine that the title short song might have been more appropriate. But smallness is also diminution, retraction, a rarefying or simplifying of elements down to their essence. It isn't a big leap from small song to small voice. I think of that passage in the Bible where God's voice is first sought in a whirlwind, and then in an earthquake, and then in a fire. But God's voice we hear is not in, is not in the whirlwind, is not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but rather in the still small voice. And we have there this sense of a magnitude that speaks through a simplicity or an essence, and that it is in listening for and to the minutia of experience in human being that we approach perhaps what is most quote-unquote divine in us. And this poem, I think, evinces that challenge, evinces the difficulty of writing on the other side of simplicity. There is no shortage of simple poems, and even of small poems, in the broadest sense of the word. But how to write a poem on the other side of simplicity, as it were. How to write a poem that traverses the small, so that the voice of something larger than that might be heard within it. And now this is going to be a small poem, too, in the sense of capturing a moment, an event, a happening, a sensibility, a feeling feeling, an intuition of a presence or of a relation, all of it passing in a fleeting instant, but where that fleeting instant opens into other magnitudes, if we could only just pinpoint it there. And so the poem seeks to identify a moment, to point it out or locate it, and in locating it, perhaps to slow it down, isolate it, make it still. How do we go about locating a moment and understanding what it is and how it affects us? We need to think about how it happens. And this is a poem that, in a very simple sense, tries to zero in on cause and effect relationships. When this happens, then this happens. The poem opens with a when, an occurrence, an act, and discerns a consequence from that act. Now that seems like a fussy metaphysical way of talking about what is obviously a very moving love poem, but we can see how the very conditions of the love poem itself come to bear on this relationship. This is a love poem along the lines of, this is what you do to me. Two actual things are done in the poem. There is a kiss and pins are lifted from hair. How beautifully simple to build a poem out of these two diminutive gestures. These are the two gestures, but it is what results from these gestures that falls into question in the poem. I mean, part of what lies at the heart of this love poem is the offering to the addressee, the lover, this kind of power, this kind of agency or value or effect in the mind of the speaker. And surely that's one of the elements that lies at the core of the love poem tradition itself. The speaking voice attributes a power and an energy to the loved one insofar as it says, this is what you do in being what you are. Your being is this kind of offering. Your offering has this kind of effect. All right then. When you kiss me, snow is falling.
Now, on the surface, if you like, this has the look of a cause and effect relationship, right? When you kiss me, snow is falling. But surely the more obvious cause and effect statement would be when you kiss me, snow falls. But Zwicky doesn't say snow falls, she says snow is falling. The verb tense here is the continuous present, something that is happening all along, as it were. Consider the difference between when you open the door, I enter, and when you open the door, I am entering. In the second instance, you think, well, good thing you opened the door just then, or I would have hit it. So it's interesting, right? I mean, there's this cause and effect logic that is suggested, and yet at the same time, there's this apperception of a simultaneity that the kiss and the falling snow are simultaneous that one doesn't cause the other. This lovely apperception of the kiss as somehow aligned metaphorically, temporally, with falling snow itself. It is simply that these two things are happening in the now of the when. And it might be worth observing that there is a now that is actually built inside the snow, a now buried in snow, could we even say? Robert Lowell has the wonderful line at the beginning of his poem for the Union Dead, the old South Boston Aquarium stands in a Sahara of snow now. He actually juxtaposes the two words so that the relationship jumps out at you. And what, after all, does the lovely perception of falling snow during a kiss evince but a now, the now buried inside of snow, as it were? So the poem seems to anticipate in its first sentence a cause and effect relationship, but if it doesn't altogether renounce it, it delays it. Delays it until the third line, actually, when we come to my grief slips from me like a shawl then. So there's the completion of our when this happens, then this happens, cause and effect construction. But in the meantime, that cause and effect relationship is delayed by the apperception of the moment itself, and the moment is drawn out by the second line. It fills the the pine, the snow that is, it fills the pine trees in the night. So look at how that's working, this sitting a moment longer with this event that is happening simultaneous with the kiss, elongating, if you like, the reach or extent or spaciousness of the when. And, and notice how the when, that is the identification of a time, is elongated in an expansion of space. So when you do this, this moment, then snow is falling. This thing that is happening in time aligns with something else that is happening in space, and that space itself is expanding. It fills the snow, that is. It fills the pine trees in the night. And that filling out of space, which is also a filling out of time, establishes a rise and fall or fall and rise uh, action that is going to come back uh, again in the poem. But in this instance, it's the apperception of a falling and then a filling with the, the snow falling fills. And we hear, of course, the relationship between those two words, fall and fill. But we also see how they move, as it were, in opposite directions. Falling is downward and the filling of the pine trees is upward. A filling up, a descent down into that aligns with the entire theme of diminution and smallness, but then a filling up that aligns with a feeling of plenitude and spaciousness. The filling up or filling out to a plenitude then becomes the very means of delaying the now that is buried in the snow is falling. It becomes the means to capturing the nowness, the hereness of the when you kiss me. This second line isn't done with its relations and uh, issuances, but we'll lay it aside for a moment. And in laying it aside, we come to the effect of the cause that has been witnessed, my grief slips from me like a shawl, then like lace. Now, of course, there isn't a necessary cause and effect uh, relationship between uh, when you kiss me, snow is falling, and my grief slips from me like a shawl, then. I could say, I put this coffee cup on the table, and it was then that a dog barked. The first hasn't caused the second. But let's say here that most cause and effect observations are based on a when-then construction. When this happened, then this happened. The first word of the first line aligning with the last word of the third line, making a kind of symmetry. 
which doesn't end there. In fact, that it doesn't end there it makes a point in itself, but nonetheless, it establishes our logic. And so what is the content of that logic? If the grief slipping from me like a shawl then has been caused by something before, what exactly is that cause? Seems to me there are two possibilities. One, of course, is the kiss itself. When you kiss me, my grief slips from me like a shawl then. But that kiss seemed at first to be part of another cause and effect logic that was delayed, as we saw. When you kiss me, snow is falling. Those two became part of a simultaneity, and it seems reasonable to observe that it is that simultaneous occurrence, the kiss and the falling snow, that are potentially metaphorically identifiable together become the occasion of the grief slipping from me like a shawl. And the implications for a love poem are significant, I would think. The first possibility suggests a kind of subordination of effect to cause, right? I mean, when you kiss me, this happens to me. The second alternative is more participatory. When there is this stilled moment that happens, then my grief slips from me like a shawl. Then the lover and beloved are part of a delayed moment that is temporally and spatially expanding, and that temporal and spatial expansion shared between them becomes the basis of a change in the emotional state of the speaker. Now that seems like a lot of fussing about with an equation that for a love poem ought to be simpler than that, but the nuance of cause and effect are going to return to us and become all the more powerful and significant uh, at the end of the poem. A few other things, though, to sit with here in the middle of the poem. Our falling and rising action has been turned around again. We have snow is falling and then it fills the rising action. It fills the pine trees and now my grief slips from me like a shawl then. The falling off, the falling away of grief gives us the downward action again, a release, a letting go, a passing away. This downward vector is maybe picked up in the phonetic relationship between shawl and fall. Snow is falling, slips from me like a shawl, then something may be going on between slips and kiss, slips, kiss, my grief slips. Maybe not, but yes, the word uh, grief is really the only em uh, word of emotional affect in the poem. This is a love poem where the only emotion that is named is grief, but it is a grief that is falling away at a certain stilled moment. And the question for the poem is what is left when grief slips away? That's part of what inhabits the poem as the property, if you like, of its unspoken remnant, the thing that you have, the thing that the poem has, the thing that the poem possesses, when its usual coverings, shawl, lace, of melancholic emotional experience fall away. Now there are quite a number of tacit metaphoric identifications throughout the poem. We've noted a few of them already, but uh, this line gives us our only actual metaphoric identification here in the form of a simile. Um, where the grief slips like a shawl and like lace. There is a refinement, if you like, of the of the uh, metaphoric identification. Shawl, uh, we could imagine, is the name of the garment itself, and lace more commonly names the weaving or nature of the fabric itself. That is, a shawl can be made of lace. And how is that working? Is, it, is there a sense there, then, of our zeroing in more precisely on the condition of the grief itself, not just our our emotional experience as a covering, a thing that we wear, but the fabric or the weaving that actually constitutes that covering. That uh, zeroing in has other implications too, just in the two terms themselves of shawl and lace. Uh, these are, we associate a shawl with something that keeps you warm, lace is something that is decorative. But the idea of the shawl as a kind of grief that keeps you warm, that covers you up, one wears one's grief in this way, and that at this moment of desirable change, that covering and that warmth are let go. Without one's grief, one is naked, and not just naked, but undecorated, if you like. The lace is let fall, the adornment is let fall, leaving you as you are. And that sense of being as you are, or being increasingly as you are, then segues nicely into the final sentence of the poem, where there is a further 
removal of the decorative or accoutred. Your hands lift the pins from my hair. So much to talk about in this last gesture. But it reminds me of the concluding lines of uh, Wallace Stevens's uh, poem, Late Hymn from the Mer Mountain. Stevens uh, elsewhere talks about uh, modern poetry as being a poetry of decreation, an unsaying of the created thing back to its luminous essence. And he concludes this uh, poem with this, with this inference, the knowledge of being, sense without sense of time. Take the diamonds from your hair and lay them down. The deer grass is thin, the timothy is brown, the shadow of an external world comes near. Zwicky's your hands lift the pins from my hair as intimately in conversation with this beautiful line from Stevens, take the diamonds from your hair and lay them down. A letting go of renunciation, a giving up of what is extra or superfluous in human being that we might come forth, come through as simply ourselves. And all the way through the poem, of course, there is this relationship between things that are filling up, things that are elongating and expanding in space, and things that are falling away, things that are being let go, with the inference shared with Stevens that there is a renunciation at the heart of plenitude, and a plenitude at the heart of renunciation. And these are picked up in the upward and downward movements of the poem, and those upward and downward movements, we think of Eliot's the way down is the way up, and so on. But that nuanced relationship between rising and falling is picked up again in the final lines where your hands lift the pins from my hair and we intuitively understand what effect that is going to have that is the hair will fall a lifting and a falling though in this instance the falling is left unspoken how beautifully and there is throughout this phonetic relation between the words fall fill and lift uh, a f a l f i l and then l i f fall, fill, lift. The intimate relation between the hands and hair. Why is this making me think of uh, Elizabeth Bishop's wonderful poem, The Shampoo, where there is, again, this wonderful, intimate, and unspoken love expressed in the simple act of shampooing. Here, the touching of hands and hair, bespeaking so much that is left unspoken in the poem. The H-A-H-A in both instances, twining. But look at the parallel construction, too, of it fills the pine trees. We said we'd come back to this. Uh, it fills the pine trees and your hands lift the pins. Fills the pine trees, lift the pins. Uh, pine and pins, they are very close. Fills and lift, close as well. Both of them filling, rising, lifting actions. It perhaps follows that if those two are aligned, that is the filling of the pine trees in the night with snow that's falling and the lifting of the pins from your hair that's going to make hair fall, that the falling hair that is left unspoken aligns then unspokenly with the falling snow. Snow is falling. It hangs out there at the end of the first line. And what is left implied at the end of the last line is that hair is falling or that the hair will fall. This beautiful, suggested, and intuited metaphoric identification between that apperception of a present moment grasped as it expands in t space and time, aligning with the falling down of the hair that is only unspokenly glimpsed as the final effect of cause that comes before it. And look what else. There's an inverse of cause and effect. The snow falling causes the pine trees to fill, whereas the lifting pins causes the hair to fall down. So the down-up vector becomes an up-down uh, vector at the end of the poem. So the poem passes into the kind of silence that would align with the apperception of falling snow that comes with the kiss. That apperception of an actual present moment in the falling snow is the implied pair for this final event at the end of the poem that would represent its arrival, its accomplishment, the final letting go, the final giving oneself up and over to the event itself, the letting down of the hair. On the one hand, the logic of the falling hair suggests a relationship with the shawl slipping away. When you kiss and when the snow is falling, my grief slips away like a shawl then, and when you lift the pins from your hair, 
dot, dot, dot. But on the other hand, it aligns with the falling snow itself that is filling the pine trees, uh, something that is happening on its own. So what am I getting at here? If there is a cause and effect relationship that really sings out in the poem, it is the final one. We know that lifting pins from the hair is going to make the hair fall. All these other cause and effect relationships, when you kiss me, snow is falling. Well, that's a doubtful relationship. Uh, uh, when these two things are happening, my grief slips from me like a shawl then. That too is a kind of tacit relationship. But we know that this last gesture really must make something happen. And yet the thing that it makes happen is left unspoken. The final logic of this for once actually tangible cause and effect relationship, the final that final logic steps off into an emptiness, steps off into the silence at the end of the poem in which it is left unspoken, unarticulated, and yet nonetheless there at the same time. And the way that it is there inhabits the space beyond the end of the poem in the same way that the falling snow inhabits the space at the beginning of the poem, as a presence, as a filling out, as a vision of plenitude. But maybe I could summarize by coming back to the nature of this poem as a love poem. There is this unspoken letting go at the end. There are all of these unspokens, but, and this is a love poem without the word love in it. That is, the word love itself is not spoken. Now, this isn't that uncommon in love poems, not to have the word love, but it's nonetheless interesting here, and perhaps even more interesting, uh, that the one emotion that is present in the poem is grief. Uh, there is an emotion that recedes, uh, that with this implied question, what is it that is left when grief falls away? And whatever it is that is left is going to be left uh, when the hair falls down. The grief is let go, the hair falls down, where are we now? What is left? We started off by thinking about how magnitudes can inhabit smallnesses, and that is, of course, exactly where we end, with a sense of the something more that comes of these diminutive gestures in the silence and space just beyond the end of the poem. And so the poem ends with this feeling of something that is about to happen, even while that something that is about to happen has been happening all along. This is a love poem that ends with an anticipation, a hope, a forward-lookingness that is at the same time already fully realized in what it is. That strikes me as a love poem doing all that a love poem can. Our thanks then to Jan Swicky for... Small Song, published in Forge, Gasparo Press, 2011.